Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to QI Connect, our third session of 2020 and our 71st session since we began. My name is Joe Matthews, your QI Connect chair for today. And I just wanted to, first of all, apologise for the, the late start of the session. We've had a couple of technical issues. QI Connect provides an opportunity for colleagues across health and social care and beyond to learn from international leaders in the fields of improvement and innovation. I'm now going to pass over to Michael to tell you how the session will run and how to use the Q&A function to submit your questions for our speaker today, Becky Margiotta. Over to Michael. Thank you very much, Joe. And good afternoon, everyone. Just some housekeeping notes to start with. Many of you will be familiar with them already, but just in case there are some new participants to QI Connect, we'll just talk you through some of these housekeeping notes. So please use the Q&A function to submit your questions for the speaker. Um, these will need to be moderated, so it may take a minute or two for your question to show up in the live chat, and I will explain a bit more about that just shortly on the next slide. Just a reminder that the session is being recorded and by taking part, we have your consent for this. Please note though, for, for future reference, if, uh, if you want to stay anonymous, you can do, um, just by not popping your name on when you sign in. In the event of technical difficulties, please bear with us. We already have had some today, but thankfully we've sorted those out. And if there are any, we'll work hard to bring the session back as quickly as possible. The recording of the session and all of the resources will be made available after today's session as soon as we can possibly do that after the holiday weekend. Next slide, please. So, as I said, um, just a wee bit more about the Q&A function. So on your screen, you will see the Q&A tab on the right hand side at the top of your screen. Please use this to submit your questions for Becky. Um, as I said, all questions are mod moderated, so they may take a minute or two to show up on the main question and answer tab. All questions submitted will show up on your My Questions tab, and once approved by one of the moderators, they'll show up in the Featured tab. If you're having any technical difficulties, please just submit these via the Q&A function, and one of our moderators will get back to you as quickly as possible. And just a quick reminder, if you see any questions that someone else has posted that you like and that you would like to be posted to our speaker today, like it and uh, that will help our chair identify the most popular questions to pose to Becky at the end of the session. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Michael. Including staff across Health and Care Services in Scotland, we've had over 5,000 participants join our sessions from 27 countries in the last year. And since QI Connect started, we've had engagement from approximately 1,300 organisations, including 89 universities and colleges. Next slide. We're having a few more technical difficulties again. Apologies about that. Delivering QI Connect is very much a team effort and what an amazing team it is. And thanks to NHS Scotland National Video Conferencing Service who continues to provide us with an excellent support for the MS Team Live event. Next slide, please. Please remember to tweet as you learn and use the QI Connect hashtag and tag in our account at his QI Connect and give us a follow. I'm delighted to introduce our guest speaker today, Becky Margiotta. Becky is the co-founder and owner of the Billions Institute, which has trained thousands of leaders worldwide and from every sector of social change on an approach to designing and leading large scale change called the Model for Unleashing. She's the author of Impact with Integrity and the host of Unleashing Social Change podcast, which I can highly recommend. Previously, Becky directed the 100,000 Homes campaign for Community Solutions, which mobilised 186 cities in just under four years to permanently house more than 100,000 people who had been previously living on the streets. A graduate of West Point, Becky also served for nine years as an officer in the US Army, both in Special Operations and Special Missions units. She has a Master's degree in Organisational Change Management, 
with awards including the White House Champion of Change Award, the Schwab Foundation Social Ent Entrepreneur of the Year and the National Conference of Citizenship. Becky's work has featured on 60 Minutes in the New York Times, the Stanford Social Innovation Review and the Harvard Business Review. And she guest lectures at Stanford University and Harvard Chan School of Public Health. In this second session, Becky will explore what you need to consider if you want to succeed at spread and scale. Something in which within our improvement work often doesn't have the same focus on the conditions and methods as the improvement work itself, which can result in the change not being sustained or actually being what is not needed at scale in the first place. Having recently undertaken the model for unleashing training myself, I know you're in a great session today, so I'm delighted to welcome Becky to QI Connect. Over to you. Thank you, Joe. Hey, and good to see you. Good to see you, Michael. Good to see Jessica. I don't know if Paul's on here, but Paul Arbuckle, if you're here, good to see you too and the whole gang. Um, greetings from sunny Southern California, where uh, our day is just getting started. Um, I am uh, I'm really excited to get to have this half hour with you to share with you some of my thoughts about, you know, what does it take for successful large scale change? So uh, can you see my my slides right now? Just uh, maybe Joe, if you could just say verbally because I can't see you anymore. No, no slides are up as yet. OK, share. Share, OK, oh, there it is. OK, this should work. Uh, how about now? We can see you now. Great. Great, great, great. Thank you all for, for your patience on that. So um, I am just thrilled to get to have this little bit of time with you to, to share with you something that I'm thinking about all the time, which is what does it take to succeed at spread and scale? Now I have six things I want you to ask yourself in 30 minutes and then we'll do some Q&A. So please jot down your questions um, and, um, and take screenshots. Uh, and we'll be sharing the slides, but some things I'm just going to gloss over. Uh, if you come to one of our trainings, like Joe and Michael did, there's, there's we spent like a whole hour on some of these. Uh, but we're just going to give you the high level stuff. And then if you want more, we'd love to be helpful down the line. So um, just offer this not as, um, although we've trained thousands of people, I offer this as confidence that these are questions you must ask and answer. I don't know the right answer for you. That's going to be for you to decide. I will say, having trained thousands of people on this, these questions are really important. I will stand by these questions. OK, so uh, speaking of which, so this is the Billions Institute. We teach people how to design and lead large scale change. We're talking from education, healthcare, human services, trying to stop gun violence in the United States, uh, working to support more people in getting their citizenship, like all kinds of things. Uh, we, we work with people. So and the wonderful thing about working across so many sectors is we get to see what's common across all of them um, because when you're in your own world you can start to kind of uh, get a, sometimes can get tunnel vision of like well this is the only way you can do it but what we've seen is the challenges and the opportunities really have a lot of similarities across sectors so that's what i'm excited to share with you the big picture gist of this it just is a mindset shift when you want to go to spread and scale and 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 if you're asking yourself, how can I get these turkeys to do what I want them to do? I, I predict you'll most likely fail at large scale change. What we try to help people do is shift to this, this better question, which is how can I help all these people do what they wanna do? And to do that, it's highly relational at scale, highly relational at scale, where you're really tapping into intrinsic motivation in an authentic, powerful way. It's beautiful when it happens, it's magnificent. We, we call success, as Joe alluded to, unleashing and we define unleashing as orchestrating the loss of control of thousands of creative people who are moving in the desired direction so it's a little bit of a paradox right we're trying to orchestrate the loss of control we're trying to control the loss of control of people we've never met where me and joe mccannon came up with this model part of this from the work that i did that joe alluded to on the hundred thousand homes campaign which was in the u.s we got 186 cities to change the way that they were addressing rough sleeping and over four years those cities were able collectively to move 101,000 people off the streets in less than four years by changing their practice really pragmatic practice change I want to give you almost like a foreshadowing of like the best possible day in your life if you're leading large-scale change which wasn't this day 
it wasn't the day that we got to unveil and celebrate that 100,000 people moved into housing. Of course, you should celebrate. Of course, you need to have those moments and mark those. But the best day in the 100,000 Homes campaign for me as the leader came the day that I woke up and I had a Google alert to this news pizza cycle. So Hilo, Hawaii, uh, I, there's, it came across in the Google News, Hilo, Hawaii kicks off the 100,000 Homes campaign. And as the director of the campaign, I'm gonna be really honest, we hadn't trained them. They hadn't signed up for the campaign. I didn't know them. And I was angry. I was irritated. I was like, who are these people? And I tried to call them for two weeks and be like, yo, you're doing our thing. And they didn't even care enough to call me back because they don't care that they're doing my thing. I care that they're doing my thing. Finally got through to them. Swim and Brandy, lovely human being. And I was like, hey, you're doing my thing. And she was, she was like, yeah. It's awesome. And I was like, how did you even learn about it? She was like, oh, I met someone at the Starbucks and she gave me she gave me your notebook and I just decided to do it. And, and I and I was like, oh, I shouldn't be irritated. I shouldn't be pumping the champagne right now. Like, this is amazing. Someone I've never met is doing my thing. So here's some questions. I'm assuming that you're here because you have something that you really think is important to share with other people that you're excited about, that you think makes people's lives better, that reduces suffering in some way. And what I want to do is get you on that pathway where you wake up one day and someone you've never met is 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 putting into use your solution and making really good things happen in the world. So let's jump into these questions and feel free to take a screenshot, jump some notes. I'm going to come back to these six questions anytime. But they're, first, it's just real simple. What are you going to spread or scale? Which is not as simple as it sounds. And then what's your aim? How much by when? How are you going to get leverage? How does your team need to detox first? Because your team, if it's got problems, it's going to hold you back. And then how are you personally most likely going to sabotage the effort? There's inner work, I think, required. And then how can you liberate yourself and the rest of your team to do this work of spread scale from a place of genius? And I'm just going to touch on these briefly. I wish I had more time with you, but but this is this is the road that I travel with people. So let's start right now with what are you going to spread scale? So um, we didn't even used to ask this. People just showed up at our school. We have a three-day school on spread and scale, and we assumed people knew the answer. And so we'd like, okay, what are you going to spread scale? And they'd be like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> like, Why are you here? And so, uh, and, and here's what can happen is people fall in love with their solution right? And it's always just really complex because they're too close to it. And what we got to get to a point is where we can say, um, I have this solution that solves this problem. And it's an equitable solution. It's a solution that really actually solves the problem in some fundamental way. The problem is that people fall in love with their solutions. But one of our colleagues, Dr. Christine Ortiz Guzman says, no, 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 no. Fall in love with your problem. So if you fall in love with the problem, let's say, I'm gonna talk about this later, maybe the problem is macular degeneration, maybe the problem is, is un, un, unnecessary avoidable blindness, right? Then you're gonna keep coming back and doing these PDSA cycles and innovating and being like, what solves this problem? And, and then as you discover what solves that problem is, then bring that to spread and scale. So it's gotta be something that fundamentally solves a problem. The next slide I'm gonna share, please by all means take a screenshot. This is what Christine Ortiz teaches about how do you fall in love with your problem? And, and, and it's included in our exponential impact course. We take people through these modules, but making sure you understand it at all five levels of oppression and liberation, in, internalized, interpersonal, institutional, structural and ideological. You really want to understand the problem in depth. Um, and then you want to eliminate all the problematic narratives. So we don't want to describe the problem, for example, as deficiencies in some way of the people experiencing the problem, right? We want to really look at it from a systemic piece um, and, and say, oh, wow, okay. Th so this that's important. Like in, in the United States specifically, like there's a lot of pull yourself up by your bootstraps and white saviorism narratives that get woven in to how people describe their problems. And when that's our mindset, our solutions aren't equitable. They're more paternalistic and, and less likely to be effective. That's what we're all about is effectiveness, which requires you to understand your relationship with the people experiencing the problem. Are you yourself someone experiencing the problem? Is it someone, a loved one in your community? Or do you have some expertise that in partnership you can solve that problem together? 
And then the last piece is just confidence that your solution actually works, which you get through the quality improvement that all of you are familiar with. So uh, I'm not gonna believe at this point, it's six modules in our course. There's way more to this, but I wanna put these questions out here for your consideration. The next question I think is one of the most important ones you can possibly ask, which is how much by when? We spend about three or four hours helping teams get a quantifiable, bold, time-bound aim in our course. It's critical. If you get this wrong, everything else is gonna be off. It's all inspired by Dr. Don Berwick, uh, the founder of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, when he launched the 100,000 Lives campaign in the United States, he stood on stage and he said, "Sum is not a number, soon is not a time. We're gonna prevent unnecessary deaths for at least 100,000 people in the next 18 months. And I, I forget the date, but he was like, June 2nd, 8.30 a.m., you know? And, and, and that, it was so galvanizing, such a powerful way. And it was such a uh, doable, but real stretch goal. And that's the key is to find that sweet spot. And we can teach you parameters on that, but it's just some high level things because my understanding having worked with the NHS for many years now is, is um, and trained literally hundreds of hundreds of people on how to go to scale in the National Health Service is is there there's there's some some interesting challenges that show up there. So one is um, improvement does not equal unleashing. And so a lot of times people will show up at our training uh, kind of with a process outcome. So it'll be something like 70% of our clinics will implement some really complicated and jargony and acronym filled process measure by June 2022. Okay. Um, and then I go talk to them and I'm like, what does this even mean? And they're like, well, and, and as I start to like kind of peel the onion on what they're actually talking about, I'm like, oh, wait, you're going to prevent blindness. And if you get it to this many people, it'll be 2,000 people who don't go blind by this summer. Are you kidding me? Now I'm motivated. Like, I actually really am not that interested in your process uh, measure, but I'm very interested in the outcome that you're going to get. So that shift from process, which is super um, ingrained in the improvement mentality uh, to an outcome measure that you're going to hold yourself accountable is really important for getting people motivated for spread scale, because like, who cares about somebody's process measure, right? But we all care about preventing blindness for people. So it's a big pivot that we help people do. And I just want to just put that out as a friendly provocation for all you. Um, another thing we see a lot working in the National Health Service is that leaders show up and they've just been given an aim by their supervisors. And they're, they just show up and they're like, yeah, this is my aim. I have to, this is what I have to do. I've been told to do it. And I'm going to do it. And, and they're not upset about that. It's just how it works. Um, but what happens when they run their inherited aim through our algorithm, they realize that that inherited aim was 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 far less ambitious than you could actually achieve, right? And then they have this dilemma where they're like, oh my gosh, do I go tell my boss we could actually do more? Or do I just do what do I do what we can do? And I'm always like, hey, that's up to you, but it's got to connect to your heart. It's got to connect to why you're here. Does this solve a problem you care about? Then just swing for the fences, my friends, you know, or is this just something you have to do because you have to do? That's where we get to this unleashing where we're really tapping into like, why do you care? Why does this matter? Why does it matter to you personally? Because it's not easy. You know, it's, it's not easy doing this stuff. So you've got to be really, really connected to it. Um, one thing I know that you all kind of struggle with as well is that there's sometimes political pressure for urgency, and I get it. Like, this needs to be done yesterday, right? Um, and, and this is another one of those things where there's a paradox where you want to have the, the kind of the generative pressure of a time-bound aim where you're like, we got to get going on this uh, without being overwhelmed. And, and, and that's not something that I can give you some direct parameters on. But if you're a supervisor and you're the person who's kind of breathing down people's necks, what I would suggest is to be as collaborative as you possibly can in setting those goals and objectives so that people don't feel like it just kind of got put on them and they're getting under pressure. But it's like really genuinely mutually owned. And that's where you're really going to see people unleash in these really powerful ways. So we do have a, a methodology for helping you get in, in the ballpark of this kind of just right aims. Um, but but these are some of the, the high notes of what we've seen working with the National Health Service a lot. All right, moving right along. I apologize for going so fast, but I want to get this stuff to you. Question number three, how are you going to get leverage? So here's the deal. If you've been working in your clinic or your practice or your wherever it is, and you've got something that really works, that's great. But now how are you going to get to, to 10, 15, 20 other places? 
you're going to have to get leverage. And most of our first instincts is to think, well, I just got to work harder. So this is a picture of me in the 100,000 Homes campaign where I was doing our intervention and going from city to city, city doing it. And the reason this picture is funny for me is my team took a picture of me and they were all cracking up about it and sending it around to each other because I literally could not wake up. I was so tired. I could not lift my head up from the desk. I reached this point of exhaustion. And, and you will too, right? You've got to get leverage. And there's three new things I want you to think about, right? So in our minds, your, our preconceived notions often are like, okay, I've got a solution. I want to spread it. Let me do a training. Or I've got a solution. I want to spread it. Let me change the regulations. Let me change the payment in the US. You all don't have to worry about that, right? But let me let me change the incentives in some way. And like none of those are actually in and of themselves sufficient to get to large scale change. So there's three things that we teach people to pay attention to for getting leverage. Raising awareness, building will, and transferring skill. Awareness, will, and skill. Boom, 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 done, done, done. And there's many ways to do these things. There's many ways to raise awareness. There's many ways to build will. And there's many ways to transfer skill where people are learning how to do things without you being there. Remember my story about Hilo, Hawaii. We taught somebody how to do a registry week which is like a week long volunteer effort without us even needing to be there. So you need these mechanisms. The whole key for this, like the way to operate in this part of it is from this wonderful quote, tight on aims, loose on everything else. That will, that's what we're looking for. Tight on aims, loose on everything else. So we've got our aim. We're going to keep on calibrating. We're going to measure how are we doing. We're going to course correct all the time. That's where you do kind of the PDSA cycles at scale. So we know we're not going to we're not going to let go of our aims, but we're willing to give anything a try that might get us there, especially tending to awareness, will and skill. All right. Three more questions. So how does your team need to detox first? Let me tell you what um, I live in Los Angeles. It's kind of we're kind of famous for our smog. Um, and, and this is actually what I see on my window when I'm like, flying into LAX. And uh, I just want to say, like, it would just be foolish for me to assert to you brilliant medical professionals that like I'm going to be the person who lands at LAX and doesn't breathe this garbage in. Every time I come home from England, my lungs hurt for like two days, right? Like y'all have the most best fresh air in the places that I've been, right? And, and I haven't been to Scotland yet, but I'm coming soon. And Wales certainly just super duper fresh air. And um, it's the same way with, with centuries, if not millennia, of oppressive systems and structures that have unfairly advantaged some and extracted resources from the earth and labor from people in ways that result in oppression, right? And so um, we all live and operate in, whether we like it or not, a society that has some marginalization and oppression built into it. We didn't, we didn't it's not our fault wasn't our idea. We inherited it. We certainly, we've been breathing this smog, me, for me, 53 years, okay? Um, this wonderful, brilliant woman, Tama Okun, right, wrote this beautiful piece about white supremacy culture. Uh, it also, her newest version that came out in 2021, she also talks about class, because I know in the UK, uh, it, I've heard many people say, um, I've heard many white people say, it's not about race here. And then I've had people of color pull me aside and say, oh, yes, it is. Um, but a lot of people have told me it's about class. I will tell you in the United States, it's very much about race. Um, and we share this with people who come through our trainings and we say, hey, let's wrestle with this. How has this infiltrated our organizations? How does this get in? How is that smog getting in? And Tema goes through really practical, pragmatic ways. Like we've done this so many times. We know that paternalism, perfectionism, comprehensiveness, um, uh, uh, transactional goals, uh, basically deferring to people because of their title or rank. You know, like I've heard, had people tell me that people will introduce themselves as what band they are um, uh, and, and like, like those types of things, right? Um, how are those embedded into your team and your ways of operating opposed to what this wonderful woman, Daniel Lim calls a regenerative and a liberatory culture. And what Daniel's piece says, and this is in Medium, you can Google and find this, is, is, um, is he's a Chinese American man and he says, I know 
oppression. And it's not just white supremacy because I'm Chinese. I know Chinese supremacy. And he said, here's the deal though. We need to stand on Tema's shoulders and say, not just antidotes. We want to go all the way for regeneration and liberatory culture. And what I want to submit to you is after, after seeing, we have a, a, a deck here where we help people like identify which are, which are the challenges you're seeing on your teams. I, I've yet to find a team that doesn't have, you know, many of these, these norms that are holding their teams back. So there is some work to be done in liberating ourselves and our teams from perfectionism, comprehensiveness, paternalism, you know, transactional goals. And that's going to be wind in the sails of, of creating this, this unleashing context. I'll put a link in the chat while we're doing the Q&A. Uh, but if you want to learn more, I have a podcast, as Joe mentioned, and I interviewed uh, Tema Okun about her article and about how she sees it play out and what we see in organizations. And it's just, it's our most downloaded episode of all time. If it's interesting to you, I just wanted to recommend that to you. Uh, and it's as a way to just kind of spark your curiosity. But the more we can create a liberatory context, the more we're not gonna, our org we're not gonna have our organizational dysfunction getting in our way. All right, two more questions. So. How are you most likely going to subconsciously sabotage the effort? This is quite frankly, my favorite thing to work with people on because um, uh, you know, everyone, people are really comfortable with like, oh, let me, let me make my aims, you know, how, let me do that. Um, but uh, let, me, let me be really, you know, kind of in my left brain and rational and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, but what about you? How are you gonna hold it back? So um, my, my kind of, my, my, my mantra in this is we're not gonna make any progress out there until we take full ownership of everything going on in here. And I feel kind of stupid quoting myself, you know, but like, I believe in my bones this is true because having led a large scale change initiative and having coached hundreds of large scale change executives, here's what I know. And I know you know this too. If you stick your neck out there and you say you're going to go for a big aim, here's what's going to happen. You're definitely going to get criticized. You're definitely going to get blamed. You're definitely going to feel overwhelmed. You're going to have to make hard decisions. You're going to be tempted to micromanage. You're going to be seduced by those dependency narratives. You're going to feel unappreciated. You're going to want credit for your work. People are think, going to think you're trying to steal credit for their work. People are going to project their unhealed childhood wounds onto you. People are going to feel envious of your success and people will actively undermine your success, right? And all of this I promise you is going to happen if it's not already happening in your life. It's definitely going to happen if you stick your neck out there for large scale change. And the horrible, the horrible truth of it all is even though we want to get people, thousands of people we've never met doing things that we would like them to do, we actually only have three feet of influence, right? Like we can only actually influence, influencing at scale is actually within our three feet, right? Like who you're in community with, who you're in connection with, and then that can have ripple effects. So if we're not, if our energy isn't clean and healthy, we're gonna be introducing that, that friction and that static into the whole ecosystem, and that's gonna undermine you too. So we also go into this a lot. Um, uh, you know, oh, I had the urges. I have a book that I want, I'll put in the chat also. This book just came out in the United States, May 10th. It's gonna come out in June in the UK. Um, but it basically is is a love letter to change leaders about how to do this inner work. And it's just like, here's the stuff that's gonna come up and here's how I want you to think about it and and, and work on it. And here's what you can do in really practical ways. So uh, we'll give you the, um, the first chapter for free. I'll put that link in the chat too in a minute or two. So um, the last question, I think we're doing really well on time here. Uh, appreciate you staying with me for the whirlwind tour um, is how can you liberate yourself and the rest of the team to contribute towards your shared aim from your genius? So I want, genius can sound kind of jargony. I think it's more in the popular lexicon now, but just take a moment and just jot this note down to yourself. If you could stop doing one thing related to your work, and I'm saying like I was the work fairy and you never ever have to do it again, what would you let go of doing? What's the thing you would let go of doing and never have to do again? And I wish I was the work fairy. I'm sorry I'm not. Okay, I hope you all have something. Usually people have to mind immediately. Um, when I learned about genius and what genius is, is the stuff that you love doing where you lose track of time. If you're honest, you would do it even if you weren't getting paid, right? But you still wanna get paid. Everybody should get paid for their labor, right? Uh, but you're, it's stuff that doesn't even feel like work and you can't believe you get paid to do it. 
the more I can be doing those things in service of whatever I'm involved in, the better, because now my only problem is making sure I take enough vacation time, but I'm not even going to burn out because I love what I'm doing, right? And so not everybody has massive flexibility about this, but usually there's some within a team where you can cross level things. But in some cases, like we never ask, we never ask. And we feel like we have to performance manage people to work on their weaknesses and stuff. Like I'm just not in that camp, you know, Uh, it's it's the people, if, if they're there, and they have gifts and they want to contribute. Our jobs as leaders is to find that and unleash that in them. So when I learn about what the Gay Hendricks calls your zone of genius, which is that what I just described, excellence is you're great at it, but you get you do get kind of tired at the end of the day. Competence, clearly it's just like you're good at it, but everybody else is better. And incompetence, which is like you're actually bad at it. I tracked for seven weeks everything I did and categorized it as genius, excellence, competence, or incompetence. And I realized like, wow, managing people or projects, eh, maybe competence. Keeping track of how much money our team had spent, like in a $2 million budget, maybe incompetence. Deciding whether or not people should go on vacation, things like managing the team, competence at best. Networking and nurturing partnerships. I feel like that was an excellence, but when I was honest, it kind of wore me out managing complicated relationships with national partners, other people were better, and research and analysis, not my thing. And I was spending about 60% of my time doing just this. And I was able to go to my boss and say, hey, what if you could have 100% of my time doing this, you know, envisioning a different future, inspiring people to take risks, giving keynotes, imagining being in the future for the team. So we're really living into that future and creating space for others to shine in their genius, right? Which is just a particular way. This is like pulling out of bed for me, right? Like I'll go give a keynote. I love talking to you all, right? Um, And some people like people, some people would rather die than give a keynote, right? So we've just got to cross level it across our teams and get really clear on what's our genius and get really clear on what our colleagues' genius are so that they can spend more time in their genius, you can spend more time in your genius, everybody's happy, and then you're just really off to the races. And um, there's a lot more about that in the book as well. As I said, I'll put the link for Tama Okun, um, that podcast in the chat, and I'll put the link to download the first chapter for free of that book. I definitely invite you to check out the book. Um, It's just, it's written for change leaders. It's exactly for everybody who's on this call. Um, I think to my amazement, I got through this quicker than I anticipated. So I think I might've even got us back on on time. So I think we're gonna do some Q and A. So I'm gonna uh, stop sharing uh, if I can, or if you could take the thing back. And uh, and I'll Joe, I'll follow your lead. Wow, thank you so much, Becky. A, a huge amount of really thought-provoking questions there, which I know that people on the call um, will find incredibly useful as part of their overall improvement journey. As we start this Q um, Q and A session, we, we always have at this um, within QI Connect a guest questioner. Um, and I'd like to introduce Jacqueline Morton, who is Head of Quality Improvement for Southern Health and Social Care Trust in Northern Ireland, who has the question. So, Jackie, are you there? I am indeed. Hi, how are you? Hi, Becky. Um, I'm feeling so inspired listening to you. I'm sitting in Northern Ireland. It's tipping it down. It's cloudy and damp. I'm looking at you and seeing the sunshine, but the energy is just radiating through the waves to me. So your job is done today. So I'm hoping that my question is an easy one for you because it's something I have struggled with. It's about how do you know? How do you know when you get to the tipping point for the thing you're working on is good enough and it's ready for spread and scale? You're on mute, Becky. There. Okay, I you. had these little chats showing up, but I couldn't click on you. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, that's a great question. And here's the thing: literally about a week ago, I did a presentation just like this on how do you know if you're ready to go for scale. Oh, brilliant! So, so let me let me request control if it's okay and share my screen again. If that's if that's possible. Um, but but here's the thing: before I share the slides, there's a feel too there's a gestalt to it and and here's how i know for me is am i am i pushing my solution out or are people pulling 
my solution to them, right? And and it's like it's like it's more I'm looking for the pool that people are like, hey, how do you do that thing? You know, and they're like, oh, maybe I need to share this. There's also another thing is like this fine line between imposition and invitation. So in the early stages, you want to, I mean, always, you want to be an invitation and then see if people pull it in. But let me just go ahead and just share these other slides with you uh, real quickly. Uh, so you could take a screenshot if you'd like, but these are the questions you must answer for, am I ready to go to scale? So you'll see some of them are the same. The last two are the same because I think that's always essential in your organization. But it's does your does your solution need any tweaks to really be ready to scale? And especially in the equity piece. And then how can you refine your solution using Everett Rogers diffusion of innovation work so it's easier for others to adopt? Can you make it more beneficial to the people who would be impacted by it? Can you make it more simple? Can you make it more culturally compatible? Can you create a way for people to do a trial run on it? Or can you create a way for people to observe it in action? Um, and then the last thing would be getting clear on your end game, which is where are we going with this thing? You know, it's a, it's a wonderful article by the Stanford Social Innovation Review called What's Your End Game by Google Evan Stern. And it's just like, where are you going with this thing? Are you looking for, um, fully solving the problem? Are you looking for making it open source? Are you looking for government adoption? It's sort of like this, this kind of notion of like where, where, we, where we headed with this. So I can stop share now. Um, there you go. Uh, but uh, I think about this all the time too. So it's a great question. Oh, thank you. That's super answer. Thank you very much. So we've had a, a few questions in, in the chat box. So I'm just going to work through um, some of them for you. So back to that point in relation to sort of urgency um, and I think we, we can all um, experience it that at times in terms of get this out get it everywhere get it done as quickly as possible mm -hmm. um, and thinking about that in the context that we're now in recovering from a global pandemic with a workforce that is exhausted in some mm -hmm. cases traumatized um, mm -hmm. what would be your what would be your tips for how we get people on board and invested in that spread aim, which sometimes may feel you know really quite a stretch? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and that 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 the struggle is real, the pain is real, and the the trauma is real. Um, so I just I want to fully acknowledge that. And and I'll tell you, there's times I have a much smaller team. I'm not working with this, but person things come up like we are whole human beings we're not labor machines and because on my small team sometimes things come up where there's a family member experiencing something and we just tap out and we're like hey i'm not going to be my best for a while here and we just we know that and we honor that and we're like you go take care of what you need to as as a whole person because we'll still be here and the work will still be here and so i think that like really centering on humanity is so key and from what I've seen, there's so much bottom up great ideas. I think the way to tap into that urgency is to go bottom up and say, go to the folks at the front lines and say, listen, what were the innovations during this pandemic that you wish we could keep doing all the time uh, so that then they're motivated? It's not being imposed on them in any way. It's like it, they're owning it. And so the more you can make it to where it's truly genuinely owned by the people who will be you know, implementing the change, that then there's just organic urgency and you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to be uh, pushing people in any way, right? It's just, what are we going to do here? And, and and there's this organic, yeah, let's do that yesterday. So I think there's tons of opportunity there from what I've seen on all my all my trips over, pre, post, there's lots of frontline stuff that, that people are super thrilled to, to spread and scale. Thank you. I, and I suppose sort of building on that and back to your um, one of your opening lines around fall in love with the problem, not the solution and thinking about mm -hmm. what is it that you're actually trying to spread and that spread aim and certainly from attending the the model for unleashing program that that spread aim was a, a that was a real game changer for a number within our, our, our team. But yeah. as you're thinking about that, um, how do you what sort of tips would you have for ensuring what is being spread is done with fidelity as it grows. That's I think what you described the turkey sandwich. Yeah, yeah, Joe, great question. So um, 
Well, fidelity is really, really important for landing on aircraft carriers and nuclear reactors and probably some very complicated surgical procedures. And so like there are places where fidelity genuinely matters. And so in some ways, because uh, that can um, restrict the, the, the speed of spread and scale because you need to be um, there's not as much room for adaptability. So that can inhibit the speed of spread and scale, but you just, if it, if it requires fidelity, it requires fidelity. Um, I think what it is, is just owning that and knowing that from the beginning of like, we want this spread and scale with very high fidelity because it's necessary. But I think sometimes people over assume the need for fidelity with their things. I know I did the 100,000 homes campaign. I was like, you have to do it like this and like this and like that, or it's it's not going to work. And then I saw all these other cities doing it in these different ways. And I was like, wow, I was wrong. They came up with better things than I would have come up with. And so to the extent you're able to leave room for adaptation, that's really going to help you spread and scale. Joe, you mentioned the turkey sandwich. Mm. What we what we support people in doing is getting really clear. If you want to make a turkey sandwich, maybe you're going to put cranberry or stuffing on yours, or maybe someone else is going to put lettuce and bacon on theirs. But the thing that makes it a turkey sandwich is just two things. It's just turkey and bread. And it's and then and then whether it's high fidelity or or room for ad adaptation, you want to be as clear as possible what's the turkey, what's the bread, so that then people can decide is this the right fit for me. Brilliant. And and thinking about that and um, that team aspect and, and you describe it as detoxing the team and and, and then liberating the team from, from those sort of challenges that they, that they often face. Um we often would describe that in Scotland as that as that readiness for change aspects. What what processes are or what approaches would you recommend in, in helping teams understand are they ready for that that moment? Yeah, like in other words, like is the team sufficiently detoxed and liberated? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we do is we use that shift deck. Um, we and here's how we train it. We you could read the article, but it's not as interactive. Uh, but if you stand around the table and and put each of those potential sources of organizational toxicity on the table, and you say, "All right, everybody gets to pick two. Um, and and I, I've just yet to see it where everyone's like, "Nope, don't see any of this in our organization." Like, there's always it's not like you do it once and it's done. It's more like brushing your teeth. So detoxing your organization is like a continuous improvement exercise. And each time a new person joins your team or somebody loses your team, you have a different group dynamic, right? And different people are gonna bring different people to that. So this is, I would say with, with, with every new person who joins or leaves, there's like an opportunity to reset, recalibrate, recommit to creating a liberatory environment. Here's one other thing that um, this, this uh, group in San Diego is doing, High Tech High, it's a charter school network, is Daniel Lim has, he, he lists 12 aspects of regenerator, regenerative and liberatory culture. They're spending uh, each month, they're focusing on one of the 12 through the year and having discussions about like, okay, how can we put this aspect of regenerative or liberatory culture into our uh, into our day to day work lives? Um, and so that that would be a really fun way to just jump in and just kind of do it all the time. And mm -hmm. it's it's ongoing work is how I see it. And I think that team evolution is something that is not a, not a one off. It's a constantly. Um, yeah. Constantly yeah. You're not, it's, it's not like yeah, it's not like. Um, oh, cool, we've done this and now we're good. It's kind of like we are doing this and committed to continuing to do it. Now we're good. You know, I think that's that would be what I'd say. Thank you for asking that. It's a good question. And, and I suppose building that te teams rest within organizational cultures uh, uh, as well. So um, do you think you can spread and scale a change in culture if one team yeah. manages to shift its culture to a new mindset? Yeah, absolutely. I think you can. I think you can. I mean, I think uh, the aspects of culture, I'm thinking of um, this other organization, that's all they do is change culture. They work with people to change culture. So in a way, you know, um, I mean, what is culture, right? It's norms, rules, behaviors, agreements, ways of being with one another. Uh, but really for it to be a liberatory culture, for example, then it's it's firmly rooted in consent, and agreements and 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 that people really get to show up as their full selves and it's co-created um absolutely you could spread and scale that um those those ways of being with one another um for sure 
hundred percent. Yeah, no, that's great. And thinking about um, that, the, there are sometimes we're actually just bringing somebody new into the team will change that 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 dynamic. And, and is there something when you're thinking about those zones of genius um, around actually does that have an impact on the the detoxing of the team and maybe being able to um, move to that spread and scale place quicker by thinking about mm -hmm. actually actually re refreshing the team itself? Yes, uh, yes. So um... Uh, I mean, a new team member could also retox your team. You know, you gotta be you, you gotta be careful, right? But yes. like, <laughs> what we would what we would do is we would all do this exercise where, and there's worksheets and handouts in my book too about this. Everybody would do the exercises where they would just gain some more clarity on their genius and what they really contribute, and then also their specific aspects that maybe where they've just been suffering in silence, maybe, or it's so much more better for me as a supervisor to have someone come to me and say, you know what, Becky, like, I'm just not good at this and I'm miserable. Then I'm like, oh, wow, thank you. You just avoided me having to tell you that in an awkward conversation. <laughs> like, there's just something wonderful about the vulnerability and the transparency of that. So once collectively across your team, you know, hey, here's the genius we have. Here's the genius we think we need. Each new hire you can match it for the genius you need. So each new person joining the team kind of fills some missing piece of, of genius that you didn't have. And then of course, you also wanna re-up the culture, re-up the agreements. Like, okay, you're here, your voice counts too. Let's talk about our norms. Let's talk about our agreements. Let's co-create those together. One of my favorite things to do whenever we'd onboard a new person on the 100,000 Homes campaign team is I would sit in the back of the room and I'd say to all the people who are already on the team, I'd be like, all right, tell the new person about the rules. And they'd be, uh, you know, and I didn't know what they were going to say. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I was like, let's see what the rules are. <laughs> and uh, it was always fascinating to me to hear, hear the people who have been working on the team for some time, what they chose to tell the new people. And then it would spark these conversations, you know, and be like, oh, is that what we want? You know? And so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. We've had a huge amount of, of, of questions there and appreciate all the people who have posted into the chat. I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to um, say thank you again um, to, to Becky for your, your time today. And um, I hope the audience really, um, and I'm sure they did, find that incredibly thought provoking and will be very helpful in their approaches to spread and scale, which continues to be an area that we need to place greater focus on in all of our improvement work. So thank you so much. And also to Jackie too for her guest question as well. So thank you so much. If we can move to the, the next slide, please. You're, by the way, you're welcome and thank you for having me. So our next QI Connect session will be in September with Dr. Stephen Shorrock, who is a chartered psychologist and a human factor specialist. And this proves to be another insightful and thought provoking session. To the next slide. And of course, the rest of our back catalogue is available for you to watch and enjoy on our website. You can visit the QI Connect YouTube channel as well. And I'd just like to wish everybody a, a huge thanks again for joining us this afternoon. And we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you very much.